Good afternoon and welcome to the WCET webcast, eLearning Consortia Innovations from California and New York. Sorry about that. My mouse is a little overly sensitive today. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the manager of events and programs here at WCET. Thank you so much for joining us. We will be moving through quite a bit of content and we'll hold questions till the end of both presentations today. But as we go along, and if you have any questions or comments, please go ahead and enter them into the question box. And we'll be sure to get to those as we can. The webcast is being recorded and we will send you a link to the archive as well as any resources that are shared next week. You can also access today's presentation slides by clicking on the handout portion of the menu on the right hand side. If you have any questions, they can also help direct you. And typically we have a pretty active Twitter feed if you want to follow the hashtag WCET webcast. Today we'll move through some brief introductions give a little overview of WCET's Consortia Common Interest Group. Cal State Online will run us through their program, followed by Open SUNY, and then we'll get to questions and answers in the conclusion. Again, go ahead and enter your questions into the question box. And also, as a note, you can feel free to drag and drop any of the menu boxes that are most important to you. We have a wonderful moderator today, Kevin Corcoran. He's the Executive Director of the Connecticut Distance Learning Consortium, which is a large program operated through the State Board of Regents in Connecticut and covers K-12 through higher ed. Kevin is also the co-chair of WCET's Common Interest Group. I'd like to go ahead and pass it over to Kevin. Thank you, Megan. And on behalf of the WCET eLearning Consortium Group and my fellow co-chairs, Trisha Donovan and Russ Pullen, welcome to our second webinar of the year. Uh, just a, a quick piece on the consortia group. Um, we are a group associated uh, that was a formerly a common interest group that is a systems and consortia that are interested in sharing stories and practices around collaboration and um, success stories. So it's it's fantastic that I have a chance to come back and moderate another event where we're continuing our success stories on collaborative system and consortial initiatives, specifically with California State University's course redesign program and the State University of New York's Open SUNY program focused on increased access, completion, and success for their students. It's my privilege and privi uh, pleasure to introduce today's speakers. First, it's Jerry Hanley. He's the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Academic Technology Services and the Executive Director of Merlot for Cal State University and the Office of the Chancellor. At CSU, Jerry oversees the management and implementation of system-wide academic technology initiatives, including digital library services, course redesign with technology, affordable learning solutions, accessible technology, and Cal State Online. He is also the director of CSU Long Beach Center for Usability and Design and Accessibility and previous positions include the professor of psychology, director of the Center for Faculty Development, and the director of strategic planning for all CSU Long Beach. Wow, Jerry. <laughs> I don't know how you do it all. Joining Jerry today is Kim Scalzo, who is the executive director for Open SUNY at the State University of New York within the provost office at SUNY System Administration. In her role, she focuses on the development and delivery of services to support SUNY strategic initiatives and support campus online learning operations. Under her leadership, Open SUNY has been focused on scaling online learning with quality and has been with SUNY for six years, previously serving as the director of SUNY Center for Professional Development. Prior to joining SUNY, she spent 18 years at Rensselaer leading RPI's continuing education and distance learning activities. Just one last piece of housekeeping, um, just as Megan said, please remember to use the questions area and I'll make sure that the, the speakers receive your questions. Without further ado, please welcome Jerry Hanley. Well, thank you, Kevin and uh, Megan, I really appreciate it. And so uh, Megan, you'll pass the baton over to me. There you go. There you go. Great. Great, thank you. And let me do get this all set. All right. Uh, 
<clears throat> excuse me, I hope you all can uh, see the uh, session here. It's around changing, uh, really improving student success through course redesign. And, um, and it's great talking to other people who are at, at the system or consortium level. I think there's some very interesting issues that we have to deal with um, at this level. And what I'd like to do is just showcase some of the things that, that we're doing in the CSU. And if any of these things are could be helpful for what you're doing in your uh, system or consortium, I'm happy to share lessons learned uh, as much as possible here. So just a quick overview of the CSU. Um, 23 campuses, about a half a million students, very diverse uh, system. We have large and small, rich and poor, um, urban, rural, and I think a key aspect is about 80 percent of our students have some amount of financial aid, and I think this issue is around the affordability uh, of education becomes really important for us. And when we look at how many uh, degree programs we have and the amount of um, program and amount of uh, degrees we award every year. Um, we're kind of a, an important economic engine, education engine for the state of California. Now when we all went through the Great Recession uh, in California, we lost about a billion dollars of state funding, which was about 30 percent of our state operating expense. I'm sure many of you had similar experiences. And as a consequence, um, we actually had to reduce our enrollment by uh, 25,000 students. That's like closing a large university. Um, and there are a lot of bottlenecks, and our board of trustees um, became attentive to these issues. So um, when the uh, economies came back uh, just a bit, uh, they said, well, how are we going to deal with all these bottlenecks that, that, that we have? And so um, at a system level, we began to say, well, there's lots of reasons for these. Um, we have issues around student readiness. About 50% um, of our students uh, are coming into our university not ready in English, and about 35% not ready in math. And also we have the way the teaching is delivered. Uh, sometimes the pedagogical strategy and connecting with the students is not the most effective. Um, so how do we have to redesign those courses to really improve the ability for students to succeed? We have problems up in Humboldt County where they're pretty far north and it's a small campus and they may not have all the courses that they need. Well, is there a way to deal with their place-bound uh, challenges? Some of our facilities on our campuses are restricted and we only have a few number of seats in our STEM labs and that constrains the how many um, students can get through those courses and sometimes students are confused about what options that they have to get to their degree and uh, as always affordability is an issue. So um, I'm assuming many of these issues sound familiar to your campus and uh, what the uh, the governor uh, gave us some funding, uh, about $10 million um, to our base budget, and he says, okay, how are you going to fix these problems? So we began to look at um, redesigning, looking at across our many campuses, where were the high enrollment courses that had low success, that students were failing or they were getting grades of Ds or Ws and F at a proportion at 25% to 40%. And you have some of these, as you might guess, in the STEM areas. You have it in some of our business classes, uh, economics classes, stuff along these lines. And so th these bottlenecks of high failure rates where then students have to retake the course to, co to get credit for that course within their major, that kind of recycling of students becomes a major problem. And that became a focus of our redesign with technology initiative. For the facilities, we also looked at using virtual labs, um, and that is uh, helping faculty redesign those courses. Uh, the third bullet here, affordable learning solutions, shifting from expensive new print textbooks to lower cost options and no cost options with open education resources. And we also looked at uh, for um, place-bound students, uh, how do, can we help our faculty redesign the courses and put them uh, online and then allow the Humboldt student in Northern California take a fully online class that's available in Northridge or LA or things along those lines. And finally, the e-advising strategies, how do we help students make better choices with the various tools. So looking at 
the causes and then mapping those solutions became an important process that we went through here. And so what I'm going to show here right now are these are all resources we have online. Um, anything again that you see on here that you could adopt for your situation, go for it. It's it's yours for for reuse and um, and revision for the way you would like. In the course redesign area, um, we, we had we put together a number of programs. Uh, uh, and just in the last few years, to give you a sense of scope, we, we've, uh, in the previous few years, we had altogether around 600 inst uh, faculty bringing them together, uh, looking at uh, 500 courses across 30 different disciplines. It makes it kind of crazy. But how, in a sense, at a consortia level, can you manage these issues? in moving out different types of pedagogical strategies, flipping the classroom, supplemental instruction, virtual labs, adaptive learning. So when, when, uh, whenever you're at the system level, anything that comes down from the chancellor's office um, uh, is almost dead on arrival if it appears to be um, kind of coming from an administrative director. So uh, what we had to do, especially after being starved during the Great Recession, how, how could we incubate and get the campus uh, leadership of faculty really beginning to say, we need to look at how do we redesign our, ca our, our classes so our students can be successful and graduate in a timely manner. So we began Rather than saying we know the answer at the system level, we say campuses have the answer and we ask them to identify where do you have proven practices because not all the courses in uh, introduction to biology or financial accounting or microeconomics had very high um, failure rates. Uh, so we asked campuses to identify faculty who had proven practices as indicated by student success we kind of published information about those, and then we we said to the faculty across our 23 campuses, who would like to learn these proven practices from your from your colleagues, and we'll create these discipline cohorts, and really focus on the intervention is peer to peer sharing of those initiatives. Uh, we would bring them together in a face to face e academy over the summer, and then the faculty they could then request funding for getting a course off, or we call it assigned time, to really look at these new uh, proven practices, adopt and adapt it in the upcoming year within their campus, and participate in a professional learning community. So it doesn't want a one-stop drop-in intensive experience over the summer, but every two weeks they would have webinars for discussion and sharing these practices. And finally, at the end, faculty would have to capture their redesigns and their outcomes in the portfolios. And I'm going to show you some different pieces of, of those things in the next few slides here. But I think from a kind of a system level, um, I think a critical strategy here is how do you have the faculty be the change agents in supporting them with the funding and letting them take a leadership in propagating some of those uh, changes in, the, in redesigning those courses. Now, we realize that some of our campuses had very specific uh, bottlenecks, so we also created another program called Promising Practices that let, let them focus in on their local priorities of fixing different bottlenecks. And again, um, we still had them apply many of the same strategies that we did for the proven practices, but we had them focus on local activities. Now, the, just highlight a little bit here, the professional learning communities. Um, these are just a, kind of some of the recent titles uh, around um, uh, these webinars where we would have uh, faculty from the campuses um, share their strategies for universal design or screencasting or using um, e-portfolios or uh, other strategies um, that they had. And, and we found that really helpful at also capturing those and then posting those for other people's use. And I think one of the I'll say really important aspects around the propagation of proven and promising practices is that we had the faculty create e teaching port portfolios of their uh, strategies. 
because so much, you know, in the CSU, I've been in the CSU for 32 years, we've pushed money out to campuses, out to faculty for assigned time to do lots of creative things, and there really isn't, hasn't been a mechanism for um, collecting the evidence of their impact. So by using a really scaffolding questions within an e-portfolio, and we use Merlot Content Builder, it's free, it's really easy to use, not very sophisticated, and that's in a sense helpful with working with a wide range of faculty members, to create their stories, and I think this is no, another important part of how do you take a system initiative and bring it into a local campus or a disciplinary focus is allowing the faculty to share their voice and their strategy rather than it being an administrative voice. And these e-portfolios, you can go to this website on the course redesign website. If you just find that the red carpet image, you, you can get to over 250 faculty e-portfolios of how they've implemented their various um, strategies for improving student success while maintaining academic standards. And here's just an example that's pretty straightforward. You can think of it like an electronic poster. Many of our faculty um, uh, really found the reflective process very helpful. And I think what's really important, we now then are building a collection of practices that other faculty can look through and thumb through your kind of roller decks, and I'm dating myself, of pedagogical strategies of that are working within the CSU by colleagues in comparable campuses. And being able to get that peer-to-peer -peer sharing of strategies, I think, it, it has been very effective. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and faculty are supportive, they're enthusiastic, um, even though it's a system-wide initiative. Now I'm going to jump through some other things. Uh, one of the particular areas I mentioned was when you have facility bottlenecks, particularly in the STEM labs, uh, we organized um, a bunch of virtual labs. We created a website and we have a funding program where we help faculty adopting in a hybrid model. Instead of going all virtual, you have half the labs are virtual, half the labs that you're in the wet lab, and then you have a chance to double the capability of those wet lab facilities to bring in students because you know one week you have one group in the wet lab and the next and and that week you have them the other half of your students doing the virtual labs um, this website we've organized easy to you know uh, useful um, virtual labs across all these disciplines we have some case study and research showing the impact and we've actually found the virtual labs leading to higher student engagement, higher su success of students, and they actually are enjoying science more. Um, now all this stuff on using technology to when you're redesigning the course, a lot of times you got to redesign the space itself and working with the SUNY system, the CSU has also been looking at uh, looking at this this project called FlexSpace, where you can get in, um, think of your library of all different ways uh, that you can redesign the classroom. And because uh, you want to say, well, if I want to flip my classroom, you're right, you send them to video uh, for homework and watch lectures, but what do you do to get interactivity in the classroom? FlexSpace is a library of all these course redesigns. I just want to encourage you to look at that, some really cool stuff there. Um, and that coming down to uh, just a few more uh, topics here we'll, we'll plow through uh, before my, uh, I pass it over to um, uh, SUNY. Um, the affordability really becomes a critical issue for us. And when you see um, almost half your students are taking fewer courses um, because of the cost of textbooks, and when you have a graduation initiative of improve your four and six year graduation rate, the affordability becomes a critical and, and rather straightforward strategy to help your students, in a sense, succeed to get the content they need and take more classes. In 2010, we launched this Affordable Learning Solutions Initiative um, in which we provide alternative content, low and no cost materials tools implemented in a whole variety of ways. And I think what's important what we do is 
at the system level, we have a support program, but then you allow each campus to develop their own implementation. So at Chico, they have the Chico Affordable Learning Solutions textbook affordability, right? They brand it themselves. Sac State, they run it from another organization. The library at Stanislaus is focusing on that. Pomona does its other aspect. The uh, the, the, at uh, San Marcos, they have the Cougar Affordable Learning Materials Program. It's calming prices down. They all have fun. So at, at a consortia level, enabling a campus to brand and implement that program effectively is, is important. Now what you can do system-wide is how do you provide them common resources? So we created this cool site, the California Open Online Library. This is available and open for all of you to use. Um, and uh, and what we've done is we've organized with our common numbering system across the community colleges, the UC, uh, the University of California, and the California State System, uh, looking at the curriculum where you have learning outcomes, uh, content you need to cover, and then we aligned um, free and open textbooks with each of these we have 51 courses on that website and my guess financial accounting in your in your system is probably sim pretty similar to what's in California really easy to then look on this website find the free and open textbooks go to town another important aspect we have do is not just finding access to the to the books but creating again e-portfolios where faculty talk about how they're teaching their courses with those materials and all these the underlying infrastructure for content and technology is Merlot here and again this is an example uh, we've supported uh, SUNY we also um, Excelsior the jo University System of Georgia Tennessee Board of Regions Oklahoma with with their affordable learning solutions as well okay um, course match Real quick, I, with the next just two minutes here, um, I'll uh, with all our our campuses pushing some online courses. We have over 1,400 fully online courses and about 100,000 seats filled. But almost all of them are just students at their own take campus taking their own online courses. We have about 300 students going cross campus enrollment. And some of this we've been kind of pretty. Um, I'll say more cautious about how we're pushing students to take courses from other campuses. Um, so we, we created a kind of a set of premium courses where they're fully online and we find that the success rates in the face uh, of these online courses were comparable to face-to-face -face or hybrid because we didn't want to put students going to another campus where you, where you often find a 10% difference in the success rates for online versus face-to-face. -face. So, so we try to highlight these courses where we knew students would likely to be successful online. And, um, and in order to build that online quality, we, we're using a variety of quality matters, really pushing money out. We spend probably about 500000 a year for training our faculty, either become a QM certified, peer reviewer, master reviewer, and we have our own rubrics here too as well. And finally, e-advising. Um, complex uh, kind of processes, but I, I, some of these are around a key tool that we found is something called the course scheduler, where students can actually identify when they're free in their complex lives, and then we customize the schedule to meet their kind of graduation and academic program needs. So finally, when you look at all these things pulled together, helping students make decisions, providing them time, making it affordable and access, helping them be ready, build this community of friends with supplemental instruction, and then really create an engaging, convenient um, learning experience. So I hope that was useful um, overview for what we're doing in the CSU. There's lots of URLs there and uh, it's right there too as well. And again, uh, you're welcome to uh, leverage those resources as much as possible. And so with that, I'll pass it uh, back to Megan who can uh, pass it to Kim. Great. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Are you able to maximize your, there you go. Yeah, there. Let's see, one more time. There.
There we go. Okay, great. Well, um, um, uh, Jerry is a tough act to follow. I always learn so much after I hear um, what's going on um, uh, with your activities, Jerry. So thank you. And thanks for the plugs for SUNY for the Affordable Learning Solutions and Flexspace because I'm not going to talk about either one of those. So that's great. Um, so let me start with a little bit of an overview of SUNY um, as a system. We are a 64 campus system and um, we um, have uh, um, different sectors of campuses in our system ranging from our community colleges all the way up to our doctoral granting. So in total we have about 460,000 um, plus students and about 88,000 faculty and staff. And we um, are fond of saying that every New Yorker lives within 30 miles of a SUNY campus. And when you see the distribution of our campuses across the state, um, you know, I think that's fairly obvious. So, um, so that's a little bit about us as a system. This is the SUNY Excel's performance framework, and um, this is what um, we are using at the system level to drive activities um, on our campuses and also to, um, uh, we're using this in some um, performance-based funding that we're providing to campuses, which I'll talk a little bit about later. It includes five basic pillars of access, completion, success, inquiry, and engagement. Um, diversity and inclusion are um, cut across all of those, of course. Um, and then as we break down the pillars, um, and um, somebody um, um, I think is uh, in your papers ruffling, maybe you want to mute your microphone, I'm not sure who that is. Great. Um, so the, fir the first three pillars combined for our completion agenda, and that really is about increasing access to our campuses, improving completion rates for our campuses, and ensuring success of our graduates. That is really the space where Open SUNY is contributing the most, although we do have some activities um, in the inquiry and engagement pieces, which we um, are combining to call impact on challenges, and that's really impact on challenges um, within our local communities and also um, across the state and um, beyond our borders as well. So again, Open SUNY is really focused on um, the activities of the completion agenda, and there are defined metrics within each of those that we are trying to meet. Specifically, on the access side, we're trying to increase the number of students coming to SUNY from that just over 460,000 roughly to um, um, about 560 or 570,000. And completions, we currently are graduating about 93,000 students annually, um, and this uh, past year our chancellor announced a goal to increase that to 150,000 graduations annually. So a lot of work for us to do, um, and online learning clearly plays a critical role in that. Um, this is our um, mission. So I've been in this role for about a year now, and, um, and we've spent a good chunk of the past year really looking at everything that was happening within Open SUNY, these um, new metrics and goals that have been set out in the performance framework, and decided we need to really focus in on where Open SUNY is going to um, contribute and how we're going to support the system. So, um, so there are um, a range of activities um, that we will um, uh, um, be engaged in, to, in leading the system, um, and we really got clear about who we're serving in terms of our target audiences. So, um, so we used to say we serve students, faculty, and campuses. Now we say we serve students and those who support online students. We serve faculty and um, those who support faculty who teach online campus leaders in achieving the goals they have for online learning, and we're also um, acknowledging now our role in supporting New York State employers who have both workforce development and continuing education needs. So that's providing some programmatic focus to our programs um, uh, um, in ways that we haven't really um, done that before. So, so that's our focus. It's a little bit of a framework that we're following. Um, also this year we um, uh, um, launched the idea of Open SUNY 2.0 and really um, uh, open um, standing for an optimized personal education network. So the idea here is that um, it's really focused a lot around collaboration. Um, and so I think this really fits well within the theme of what um, um, you know you all talk about as an organization. So we're looking for more partnerships at the faculty level to um, create more modularized content and um, and support the initiatives we have going on around open education resources. 
um, more campus-to-campus -campus partnerships to leverage the strengths of our campuses in new degree programs in the high needs areas for New York State. Um, uh, more campus to employer partnerships and we're looking at providing some support at the system level to help facilitate partnerships with employers who want to work with multiple campuses across the system. Um, we are expanding a concept that we launched a couple of years ago for Open SUNY Plus um, which is a designation on our degree or certificate programs which indicates a commitment on the part of the campus and a recognition by the system um, of additional quality indicators um, that, that are inherent in the program for students, for faculty, and at the campus level. Um, and of course to support all this collaboration we need new tools and um, platforms for crowdsourcing and developing and sharing um, uh, um, open and shared course content. So, so that's a piece of Open SUNY 2.0. This optimal personal education network really just recognizes that learners are coming to us with very different educational needs. We are continuing, of course, to serve students coming out of high school looking for that two or four year degree, but we are getting many more students who have been out of, out of um, uh, school for a long time and maybe needing to come back. Um, and maybe not sure they can actually do a whole degree program. Um, we also have people coming to us with more than um, maybe one degree, two degrees, and they need just some updating of skills in particular areas. Maybe they're changing careers. Um, so, so in order to serve those students, we're really looking at the format and the way that we are are delivering and designing education and looking for new strategies around prior learning assessment, adaptive learning platforms competency-based education and stackable micro-credentials. So, um, so that there's a lot of initiative around the system really looking at what does that mean um, and trying to leverage some of the leaders in our campuses where um, some of that is happening already. Um, and of course, blended learning um, you know, is not a new concept, but we're really looking to leverage for students within our state um, the campus facilities that we do have so, um, so that we can, can provide access to more students uh, to our campuses. Um, some of the drivers um, for Open SUNY 2.0 are that we have some real gaps between the projections that are coming out of the Department of Labor for new graduates and the programs that we currently have available online. As we go to individual institutions to um, try and identify uh, um, where particular degrees can be offered, whole degree programs um, can be a challenge um, if a campus hasn't been involved in online learning or maybe it's not where they want to focus. So, so if campuses can collaborate and work together, um, the lift for each individual campus is, is less. Um, and of course, Jerry talked all about lowering the cost of education. We've had some um, initial success with OER initiatives and I'm proud to say that we have five campuses um, that are being recognized today through the um, Achieving the Dream um, uh, um, grant program who will be offering OER degree programs um, over the next couple of years and we'll be working with them to support that. Um, we also have some issues around sustainability of low enrollment programs and courses and so by um, uh, creating awareness and visibility to where those are across the system, we think with more collaboration we can, can sustain more of those. Um, and of course we need a comprehensive set of educational solutions. So going back to that concept of micro-credentials all the way up through our degree programs, um, I think we have to just think more holistically for our target audiences what, what it is that they really need. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the initiatives within each of the audiences that we're serving. And I'm going to start with campus leaders. So these are um, really services targeted at the campus leadership team. So, you know, everybody from the president, provost, CIO, CFO, um, uh, you know, the distance learning leader, the library leader, continuing ed folks, etc. cetera. Um, and so I'm going to focus on a few. Um, we actually launched, a, um, within the last couple of years, a couple of consulting services. One is called the Open SUNY Institutional Readiness Process, and the other is the Open SUNY Enrollment Planning Roundtable. And this is really about trying to get the idea of online learning as part of the strategy overall of the institution. I'll describe those in a little more detail. And then this next piece are grant opportunities. And this to me is about putting our money where our mouth is. So we're trying to help campuses think more strategically about online learning. Um, and then we're backing that up with some funding to help incentivize behavior and, um, um, and provide some seed funding for 
campuses who want to move in, in the directions that we're talking about. So the first is our institutional readiness process, and this is really about how we're trying to scale online learning across the system with quality. The goal is to increase the ability of our campuses to uh, do online learning well um, with quality and to be successful. And we do that um, uh, in a couple of ways um, through this consulting engagement process. The first is that we are increasing awareness of that campus leadership about what does it really take to ensure quality and success in online learning. And we're using the Online Learning Consortium Quality Scorecard as the standard um, that SUNY has adopted um, for what quality really means. Um, next, we are facilitating a self-assessment done by the campus to identify where they have best practices and where they may have gaps that exist that need to be closed if they're going to say they're, they're meeting all their quality standards. Next, we facilitate an implementation planning process with them to ensure that they can sustain those things that are their best practices and then also to identify the actions they're going to take to close any gaps they have. And then finally, because we're a system, we're able to enable benchmarking and the sharing of best practices across all of our, all of our campuses and um, provide a mechanism for ongoing continuous quality improvement across the system. So that's the consulting engagement process. And I mentioned that it's targeted at the campus leadership team. This is who's represented there. And um, I can tell you we have 46 campuses um, out of 64 right now that are engaged at some point in the process. And I believe we're at um, almost a dozen or 15 that are all the way through. And one of the things that campuses tell us when they go through this process is that one of the, the greatest values is getting this group of people around the table to talk about online learning as part of their overall strategy. Um, based on the success of that process, we launched another process called the Enrollment Planning Roundtable. And this is really now about helping campus leaders think about online learning as part of their overall enrollment um, and um, strategy and growth planning, and also to think about how could they real, really scale online learning enrollments. So, so in this process, we do a couple of things. The first is to help them develop a campus strategy for how much they want to grow and what piece of their overall enrollment planning will be focused on online. So, what what um, uh, uh, what role will online learning play in terms of their overall enrollments? Next, we talk to them about the economics around. Um, uh, online learning. And that's really against the backdrop of what we just did in that institutional readiness process. So they know where they have strengths, they know where they have to um, um, invest to um, uh, uh, meet the, the quality standards of the OLC quality scorecard. And if they're going to scale, what does that mean from a financial perspective? What resources do they need to make sure are available for increasing not just faculty for teaching, but um, services, technology infrastructure, um, and everything that really comes into play. Um, next, we facilitate an implementation planning process with them to help them target um, uh, new online programs, who are they for, and what recruitment strategies they're going to pursue. And again, facilitating collaboration across the system in support of Open SUNY 2.0 for new program development. So this is the enrollment planning piece of it. And again, it's focused on the campus leadership team. A similar list of people, but some nuances and differences in there. Um, for example, we have the continuing education dean or director here um, uh, and a marketing director. Um, they may or may not be involved in the institutional readiness process. Um, so next, I want to talk about a couple of those grant programs. So the um, SUNY Excel's Performance Improvement Fund um, was a fund that was established um, a year ago to um, working with the legislature um, to be able to um, um, fund um, campus initiatives in support of um, those five pillars, access, completion, success, and grain engagement. Um, in 2015-2016, uh, we committed $100 million, and it broke down into a couple of different pots of funding. Um, and campuses basically had to submit um, performance improvement plans and proposals um, for initiatives that would help um, help their campus advance in the areas of that framework. Um, and so you can see all the funds that were available. And uh, $4.1 million was set aside specifically for Open SUNY loans to incentivize online learning. Although I have to say, there were proposals in many of the other areas that were about online learning as well. So that was really, I think, a good indication that campuses are recognizing the opportunity there and really taking initiative to, to try and put new things in place. 
Next we have the SUNY High Needs Program. This program has been around actually for several years now. Um, and this is um, a fund that has been put in place to incentivize um, new program development. This is really about academic program development, new courses, new degree programs, collaborative programs in support of what the Department of Labor has defined as the high needs areas for, um, for New York State. So projecting Department of Labor um, um, expectations for graduates in particular areas. And these are the areas that were identified um, for 2015-16 and so funds um, uh, you know, have been given out and increasingly the number of proposals we're seeing and the grants funded um, in these high needs grants are for online program development or revisions. And then thirdly we have our SUNY Innovative Instruction Technology Grants Program and um, this is really now about seed funding for innovations in the use of technology in education and um, it's a competitive grant program again available to both faculty and staff um, and we provide three tiers of awards with um, criteria and expectations at each level. Of course, the you know higher up you go, the more commitment we require from the institution. But I love in this program that there's the opportunity for an, just an individual faculty member or staff member to propose something within the $10,000 level. Um, and the idea there is we want things that can be um, scalable and or replicable across the system. So um, uh, we've given out over um, um, $3.5 million over the past five years and I invite you to check out the website to see the outcomes of projects um, for the last few years because there's some pretty exciting things there. So those are all the things that we have in place for, for campus leaders and I really um, wanted to spend um, the most amount of time there because that's been I think a lot of new focus for SUNY. A lot of the things I'm going to talk about we have been doing for a while and we're just kind of um, you know enhancing or adding some services to. So of course um, um, in the area of student supports we're doing a lot. Um, we're providing a combination of things directly for students and for um, as I mentioned earlier those who support students. So the concierge model is a, um, a model that we're sharing across the system for campuses to identify someone to be kind of a central point of contact a go-to person for their online students. And then we have several tools and um, um, services that we encourage the concierge to put in place or to have available to support those online students. So the online readiness is a tool for helping students understand their ability to be successful in an online environment. Online tutoring, early alerts and monitoring and help desk are really about you know once a student gets admitted supporting them in that in that online um, space and then um, online orientation is something that's fairly new that we're working on all of our campuses have had some form of orientation in place but we're working on a repository of orientation modules that campuses can share with each other um, and be able to pick and choose from in supporting their online students so so that's a big focus for us um, you know of course when we talk about um, improving completion rates, all of these things come into play, particularly for online students. Um, again, we have a, um, a whole host of supports for faculty who teach online and for those who are supporting faculty like instructional designers and librarians. Um, we, um, when we launched Open SUNY a couple of years ago, one of the um, hallmarks of that was the Open SUNY Center for Online Teaching Excellence. There are four pillars to, the, to, to um, what we call COAT. Um, the first is our community of practice and that's really about providing a way for faculty and staff across the system to come together, to network, to connect with each other, to learn from each other, to share. Um, we have a whole competency development um, initiative which is um, based on roles identified within the community of practice. There are professional development paths mapped out for faculty and staff to achieve the competencies they need to be, for example, um, effective as an instructional designer, as an online instructor, um, uh, um, and there's other roles in there as well. Um, in terms of course supports, we have some um, uh, um, tools that we're providing and models for instructional designers and faculty in the design and the development of online courses. And then of course in the research and innovation space, um, uh, um, we are always um, interested in having a research basis for everything that we're doing um, around faculty development and online learning and wanting to um, encourage and facilitate innovation. This is the um, Open SUNY Coat Hub 
website. Um, uh, and from there, you, um, faculty and staff can join the community of practice, can get access to the competency development initiatives, um, can get access to our um, course review rubric, which is called OSCAR. Um, there are other um, resources there to check out, so I invite you all to um, feel free to visit the site and join. We also welcome um, members outside of SUNY to join um, as, a, as an Open SUNY Fellow, and so um, you're welcome to become part of our community of practice as well. And um, I'm going to just leave you with a few links to the Open SUNY website. I, I'll mention that um, uh, the first one, open.suny.edu, is really our outwardly facing site for prospective students. The Open SUNY Info site is really for faculty and staff across the system to keep them informed about what's happening with Open SUNY. So, you know, just kind of recognizing those two audiences and um, a couple other resources there as well. And I believe that is it for me. And uh, let me, yep, looks like you took it back already, so great. Kim, Jerry, thank you so much. There's some great information, some great initiatives that you have both have been overseeing. I just wonder, before we jump into some questions, um, I just love how you both have the ability to have system-wide goals and initiatives but allow the campuses to have some localization whether it's the grant opportunities through SUNY or it's the ability for a sort of a localization of deployments for uh, affordable learning solutions for Cal State. Just a quick question, how have you dealt with any resistance that you've gotten from local campuses that maybe don't necessarily see the value in a system-wide goal versus their campus specific needs? Do you want to start, Kim, or I'll, I can jump in if you want. Why don't you go ahead, Jerry, and then I'll pick up. Okay. Um, patience is really important <laughs> um, because, you know, you have to realize, and, and, you know, Kim's got 64 campuses, I got 23. Everyone is can't be ready at the same time and, and move forward. So so a lot of times you just have to wait and, and you work with the people who are ready to move forward and then you often... Um, you know, the presidents and the provosts see what their other colleagues doing and then they real, realize that, oh, they need to get ready and they might be in the second or third wave of implementing whatever these system-wide initiatives are. I'll just say real quick on affordable learning solutions. We started six years ago, but it was just last year is when we finally got all 23 campuses to participate with their own programs. And, uh, and if we said everyone had to line up the first year, A, we wouldn't have had the capabilities to serve all 23 campuses anywhere as near as Texas, so phasing it out is good. And B, they really would have pushed back because they have other priorities. So over time, if you're patient and provide encouragement, and I think what, what Kim has also provided funding, which is really very, very um, motivating for campuses, uh, you, you, can, you can work the system well. Yeah, so I'll just, I, I think, echo a couple of things that Jerry said. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, at, at SUNY, campuses really decide, um, you know, what, they, what they're going to offer online, which courses, which programs. I'm hearing a little bit of an echo, um, so I don't know if that's a microphone mute thing again. Okay. Um, so, so, you know, we are not um, in a position where we can... Um, uh, you know, say campuses, okay, here's what you must do. We really play much more of a facilitative and supporting role. Um, as I mentioned initially, we support both the system-wide initiatives and the campuses. So I think our approach has been to be at the ready with services and supports that will help campuses in achieving their goals. Um, and and I, I think our emphasis in the last couple of years on campus leaders has also been helpful because I think oftentimes um, when it gets down to the individual faculty um, level, uh, you know, um, they, they want to support the initiatives of their campus. Um, and so if there's a major campus initiative for online learning and they see that their president and their provost and their leadership are behind it, then, then that often um, is very helpful. Um, I do think that also our chancellor's, um, you know, our chancellor's commitment to this initiative and her work with the presidents and the um, the provosts, work with the provosts, et cetera, has also been helpful. So we're, I think, encouraging, supporting, facilitating, communicating like crazy 
um, at all levels. Um, uh, I think that, that um, that's been our approach, to be available to help and support those who are ready and who want to go online, which is never going to be everybody, but I think, um, you know, I don't think that's what we're going for. Fantastic. Let me jump into some specific questions. Um, so I'm going to start from the beginning. So Jerry, this one's for you. Um, how were the enrollment bottlenecks identified and was there a process for sorting and prioritizing um, the process for identifying those bottleneck courses? Uh, yep, there was a process initially. Uh, we actually looked at the grade distributions of every course across all uh, campuses uh, for one year. <laughs> And, um, and I think it was about 1.5 million uh, student enrollments and looking at all the grades. Um, and then we looked at um, uh, what are the classes that had the high failure rates. Um, and then we looked at which ones had, uh, you know, course uh, names that were pretty common across campuses to identify 22 uh, we call them really the high high enrollment, high failure rate courses that became the focus of our proven practices. So so we went through that, and and then we allow every campus to identify what those bottlenecks are. Now it, we've matured in our ability now in looking at you know where the courses where you have high uh, wait lists and stuff along those lines, and so because because there are different reasons for quote bottlenecks, you know enrollment or funding ones, you have student success ones. So the, the first one we looked at was where were our students failing, um, and that's where we looked at grade distributions of all our students, uh, of all the courses. Great. Jerry, one, one more uh, question solely directed at you. Did the faculty at CSU receive any financial compensation for their redesigns, or did they get a, a course load reduction? Uh, yes. Uh, they they got uh, paid to go to the summer institute. They got 500 bucks a day, um, and uh, they liked that extra money over the summer. Uh, and we worked the, we worked them hard too as well. Um, and they and they got um, all these programs were funded through an RFP process. So every so the faculty had to submit um, proposals. They had to meet certain criteria. They had to show blah blah blah. You know, a bunch of stuff. And a lot of this is up on the website. You can go through those. And then, um, and then every year we would be funding f uh, the faculty with release time. And sometimes they can ask for additional funds for uh, supplemental instruction, additional student aids, or s some other type of funding too, as well. So they, they they would just put together their proposals, and and then we would dish the money out in which campuses love us to do that. Great. Kim, this one's specific to you. Uh, at what level were the micro-credentialing discussions taking place and what type of guidance was provided centrally and um, how were the camp campus conversations facilitated or supported or even encouraged? Yep. Um, so we're, we're still, I would say, fairly early into that initiative. Um, we launched, uh, I believe, in February or March of this year, a micro-credentials task force. And um, that is being led out of the provost's office at System Administration. And that includes very broad campus representation. So we have um, a representation from campus presidents, provosts. We have continuing ed directors. Um, uh, and we have um, other, we have faculty, faculty governance leaders. Um, so, and they have been charged with really two, two items for this year. One is to do a survey of what kinds of micro credentials exist in the system today. So, what are we doing that could qualify or constitute as a micro credential? What does that look like? How does it work? Who are we giving that to, um, et cetera? And um, so that's one initiative, um, and they are currently doing a survey to kind of collect all of that um, body of knowledge right now. And the second one is really looking at where there are um, state um, and federal policy issues that may need to be um, looked at um, and potentially uh, changed if we are going to go down this path of some other kind of credential that we recognize at the university besides the official course or the degree. And um, you know what, as we've had some of this conversation with our campuses, 
I think some of the, the questions that they've raised are about, you know, the whole issue of we have to have recognized seat time to grant credit and, um, you know, the way that the, the federal government, um, um, you know, expects, um, you know, universities to behave when it comes to granting credentials. Um, so I think there are some real questions out there still, um, and we don't presume to have the answers, but I know there are, um, we have a whole initiative in our Center for Online Teaching Excellence around badging. So from a professional development perspective, we're getting some really good experience with how do you um, structure that, what does that look like, what are people doing with their badges, who values them. Um, so I think there's a lot of questions around that space, but we're trying to have a very um, fully engaged conversation with our campus community. Great. A couple more questions in there to both Jerry and Kim. Um, so with the efforts that you've done, you both have uh, sizable OER efforts. Has there been a time where you've been partnering with any corporate entities like Wiley for online course development? Go ahead, I, I can, sure. Um, actually, our Affordable Learning Solutions Initiative uh, is just not an OER initiative. Um, in fact, we have uh, agreements with all the major ebook distributors for our rent digital program, which is at least 60% off the new print price. And we found that you know very helpful. We work closely with our bookstores too as well. If you go to affordablelearningsolutions.org, you can see that stuff. So working with the ebook distributors, working with publishers, working with our libraries is really important too as well, um, because there's a lot of free material that our libraries provide. So um, I think on the course redesign side, we haven't. Um, we, we, we've just been. I mean. We've been running Merlot for almost 20 years, so we have a lot of internal capability to support the redesign process with OER already. Yeah, and and what I was going to say is we're partnering with Merlot, <laughs> um, uh, as as you heard Jerry mention earlier, um, and um, you know I think that that we're also trying to to um, uh, we're working a lot with Lumen Learning, um, who is really I think helping us in terms of uh, how we think about supporting our faculty um, and how we think about um, and have successful OER implementations on our campus. We also had a task group of our Faculty Advisory Council on Teaching and Technology which said we need to really take a step back and say, um, you know, if a campus is going to um, pursue an OER initiative, um, what is it that they need to have in place to be successful with that? So similar to the adopting the OLC quality scorecard as a framework for ensuring success with online learning, you said we need a similar framework for OER. So that um, task group just developed that framework and we're outlining a process for campuses to go through to assess where they are and um, what they may have to do to be, to be successful. And some of that may be partnering um, with outside entities. So so I think we're coming to that kind of at, at a more um, back-ended way, but we know there are some things in place already that we can refer campuses and individual faculty to. Great. We're about two minutes away and we have one question left. And so within both of your affordable initiatives, are you providing incentives for any of your faculty to to do uh, textbook reviews, adoptions, revisions, or, or creations? And if you are, can you talk about maybe the scale of compensation? Uh, okay, I'll, real quick, I'll, I'll say we, um, we got uh, some money from Gates and Hewlett and matched it with some state funding. Um, and uh, we did have faculty uh, do e-textbook reviews. Uh, we um, paid them about 150 bucks to $200, if I remember correctly, uh, to do the e-textbook reviews. We have a rubric that they had to follow. If you go to coolfored.org, um, you can see uh, all those reviews. And um, and you know that that, that was about the, the key is you got to have a good process you got to have a good rubric uh, for um, to uh, help these people follow and you have to provide them training um, those are really two important aspects and the last thing I'll say is we also are doing accessibility reviews to ensure that all students including those with disabilities uh, have access to the free educational content. 
Great. And th th those will be up on Cool for Ed too as well in about a month. So I'll just say very quickly that um, uh, our probably first foray into that is going to be with the um, grant that we're getting from Achieving the Dream, um, where the five campuses are all getting some funding through that. Um, and they really are deciding how the faculty are going to be, um, if faculty are going to be compensated or if there's just going to be support provided to them. So, um, so we're not driving that. We're not deciding that at the system level. Great. Well, thank you so much for the time and effort you've put in. Um, on perfect timing, Megan. Um, the annual meeting for WCET is coming up in Minneapolis this year. On, I want to do a specific plug for this group is that it looks like, and Megan will hit me virtually if I'm prematurely speaking, but it looks like the e-learning consortia group will have a half-day workshop on the 12th at this meeting. So that's a, a great achievement for us. So I'm looking forward to seeing all of you in Minneapolis and hopefully you'll be able to come to our half-day workshop for consortia and systems. But again, thank you so much for joining us today. Megan? Great. Thank you so much to Kevin for moderating. and Thank you to our presenters, Jerry and Kim. Wonderful presentations. I hope the audience gleaned as much as I did. Again, the access to the recording will be posted on our website early next week, and I'll also be sure to send you a link to the recording. I'd like to thank our WCET supporting members. They help underwrite much of the good work that we do here at WCET as well as our WCET annual sponsors. And if this is your first webcast with us, or if you're just getting to know WCET, do visit our website and learn more. We're a membership-based organization, and our members come from all across the U.S. and Canada. So thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event or webcast. Have a good day.